Thank the Lord for bringing me here. There is obstacles in our lives. There are things that will happen unexpectedly. But Jesus never that's right. Jesus never changed. Right. Our emotions go up and down. Our finances go up and down. Glory to God. Our situation changed, but we stand on a solid rock that is him. Right. Never change. I don't care. The enemy will try to tell you that the world is ending and your situation is gone. But I promise you, Jesus never fails. That's right. Hallelujah. Yeah. And you just hold on to that anchor and trust him no matter what. Hallelujah. There is a scripture that says greater love hath no man than a man who laid down his life for a friend. Right. I want you to understand there's got to be a place in you where you decide that I'd rather die first. Because okay. that's the love that Jesus is looking for from you. If the enemy can have you treasure something so greatly that when it's going away from you, you move away from Jesus, he'll always use it on you. Yeah. Hallelujah. When I come to tell you, enemy, that I don't matter. Hallelujah. God give it and he take it away. Right. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus never fail. Right. Glory to God this morning. Hang on to him somebody. Don't oh, matter. Cool. Yeah. Your life is always going to run smooth. That's what the way it is. Jesus. But Jesus never fail. Yes, yes, Glory yes, to God. Yes. Hallelujah. Oh my God. Praise I speak all the already. I thank you Lord for what you're doing. We're going to, we're going to look into the word of God and really Timely this morning, <coughs> I want the Holy Spirit to to give me the option to to preach with me. Amen. Right. You pray for me in your hearts. Amen. Pastor was just talking about the name of Jesus. Mm. Yeah, and I was just smiling, and I said, "All right, Lord, I'm going to start with Ecclesiastes three, verse twenty-one." It says the spirit of the beast goes down when it dies. But the spirit of man up. Glory to God. If you read that scripture, it's telling you that when a beast dies, a normal animal, horse, dog, cat, something happens. And when you and I die, something happens. But they're different. Says the spirit of the beast goes down. And he right, says the spirit right. of man, Ecclesiastes 3, verse 21, read it, goes up. I want to tell you that the only thing that differentiates you from the average beast of the field is the spirit that's in you. Right. You better right. believe that. You want to think that your humanized shape is enough to make you human. That is why when we don't have the spirit of God, we behave like beasts. Because mm -hmm. whether you, you, you see, we, we want to, we think because we have been gifted with higher inter intelligence. We've been gifted with our great intellect. Gifted with our great consciousness that is so different from the average animal. I'm right. um, human, and we think so highly of ourselves. But when you don't have Jesus, when you, when, you, when you have distanced yourself from your creator, you will notice that we are not different from any other beast. In fact, sometimes we're worse. Yeah. Because there's a spirit in you that has been tuned and designed to have communion with your creator. Right. See, God doesn't need the birds and the bees to get up and tell him good morning, but he's waiting for you. Right. Because there's a tuning in you. You have been designed that way. Mm -hmm. And so the scripture tells you that when you pass away, what God has put in you as your spirit goes to him. Because that's where it's destined. doesn't mean everybody's going to heaven. It just means that you are designed to commune with God. Yes. Now the beastly part of you, if you think about it, your flesh and bones, and the Bible tells you that technically, the same way the beast traverse the earth, you do that. But you're not a beast. Because you have been created in what? In God. God's image. 
And his image is not so much your physical shape. It is that spirit that's in you that has been given to you that makes you unique. I come to tell you that no matter where you go in this world, if you even find the deepest, wildest guy in the deepest, darkest cave, he has a God. You know why he has that? He is speaking to a reality that's in his system that has been placed there. There is something that has in his system that wants him to reach out to his creator. That's like a baby going for his mother's milk. Can't do any better. It's in his DNA. Right. But the Bible says when they would not regard God as God, he left them up to their reptobate mind. You know what that? That's the beastly part. <laughs> to start doing the things that are unseemly. That's why we can only behave like animals when we move away from our creator. Right. And so, in you, there's a spirit. And that spirit designed to talk to God's spirit. You are designed to have communion together. Mm -hmm. Now the Bible says in Galatians 5 verse 17, for the flesh now, Lusted against the spirit. Constant warfare and the spirit against the flesh. And he says these are contrary to one another. So 24 hours a day, there is a warfare going on in your system. Right. Especially for the people of the living God who have determined to put their spirit in God's spirit. And have God's spirit in your spirit. What happens is the war never ceases. Glory to God. And at some point in history, we find that things change between God and man. Because you are designed to commune with him. At some point in the Garden of Eden, God gave instructions to Adam and Eve. He said, listen, eat of anything you want. And I, and I, and I read that story over because you think you know that story? Read it again. There's so much in that story that we miss. You can eat anything you want. But you see that tree right in the middle? Just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. Yeah. God was on his way to make man something that we have not yet become. Right. Right. God had an idea. And he says, listen, I'm going to take you there, but just leave that one tree alone. Here's the problem with man. Man has to know everything. We're not satisfied with just knowing what we need to know. Right. You know that's how we are? Believe me. And we're still like that pastor. And so the enemy says, I know how you think. He says, God didn't tell you the whole story. Yeah. You see, something is missing. And here's what's going to happen. You're going to be better off than he actually told you you were going to be. There are trees two trees in the center of the garden and the tree of life is right there in the face of mankind and if you read the scriptures he began to taste of every tree and he never touched the tree of life mm. wow what happened saints you mean to tell me God gave me two trees in the middle and said eat of everything in other words the tree of life he could have eaten from mm. oh yeah but if you think about it, there is no record in scripture that tells you they ever even thought about eating one. Right. I have a feeling it wasn't a pretty tree. I had a feeling that the tree of life didn't probably smell as good as the other tree. You know how I know? The Bible said Eve saw that it was good for food. The Bible says she saw that it was pretty to the eyes. Never said that about the tree of life. If you understand that principle, 
you realize good medicine never tastes good. Your best food is never your best tasting food. If you want food that will kill you, get the one that is ooh, tasty. Kills you fast. But if you give the kids the good food, they say, no, man, that's not so nice. I need it. But that's the one with the life in it. You see that? The tree of life was not a beautiful tree. They walked right around it. Went ahead and hit the one that's pretty. Here's what happened. The Bible says immediately God posted angels to guard the tree of life. It says now you have denied yourself access. Hallelujah. To the tree of life because you chose to want to know what you didn't need to know. I come to tell somebody this morning that some of the things that you're trying to know you don't need to know. Because in scripture, God has already given you explicit instructions how to be saved. Right, right. See, some people are spending their entire life trying to dissect every word. They go to 20 million universities trying to know all the knowledge before they serve the Lord. And God said, no, you can't know it anyway. Right, right. So I'm giving you explicit instructions how to be saved. I'm leading you to the tree of life and all you got to do, just do what I tell you. Amen. Amen. And so, here's what's happened. I'm going to show you an example of Exodus 33. God having a relationship with the children of Israel. And he says to them, I'm going to send you to a place that's going to bless you. I'm going to send you to the promised land. And he says, I will send an angel before you. And I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and Perizzite. I'm going to send you to a land flowing with milk and honey. But I'm not going to go up in the midst of you. Hallelujah. For you are a stiff-necked people lest I consume you in the way. Ah, hallelujah. I love the name of Jesus this morning. See, God wants to bless you and commune with you. Right. And mankind put himself in a position that God has to remove his presence just to preserve you. Hallelujah. So mankind got to a place in the history of time that God designed you to communicate with you, to interface with you, but he had to separate himself from mankind for a season because he says, I am such a holy God, I am so highly exalted, my very presence will consume you because I can't dwell where sin is. Right. And this existed for many years, glory to God. And so, came to a point that God was still in the process of removing man's sin. Did it every year, annually. And he says, all right, uh, here comes the priesthood. The priesthood. How did that happen? See now, just like God drove Adam and Eve from the God, he says, mankind, you have been sinful you, I'm going to separate you from my presence, but I still got to work on your sin because I don't want to conceive you. Mr. Priest comes in and he says, Mr. Priest, I want you to be ordained. I want you to be anointed. I'm going to, but here's what you're going to do. You're going to take, uh, you're going to take Brother Otis' sacrifice every year. Right. And you're going to put it on the altar and you're going to talk to me about it and I'm going to do for a year. That's like renting salvation. <laughs> Amen. Because come next year, you're going to do it all over again. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're renting salvation. And so the priesthood existed while man was separated from God's presence. Glory to God. Hallelujah. At one point, Moses looked and he says, hold on, there's got to be more. I'm talking the same Moses who saw fire burning bush. And anyone burning. This same Moses said to God, show me your glory. What glory did he want to see, saints? Mm -hmm. Even Moses realized there's more. Even Moses realized 
has got to be more. And God said, all right, Moses, here's what I'm going to do for you. You ask me something. I know what you want. I got, I got an idea. But he says, here's what I'm going to show you. I can't show you my face because if I show you, you'll die. He says, all right. And the Bible says he put Moses between the cliff of a rock. In other words, he hid Moses where he was between two rocks. God is showing you that I have still have to pre preserve you. Just to show you my presence. And he says to Moses, Exodus 33, 20, and I will come to pass while my glory pass, that I will put you in the cliff of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand. Hallelujah. And I will take my hand, and you shall see my back parts. God don't really have back parts because God's a spirit. Right. Right. I want you to understand this. God doesn't function in dimension. He doesn't have a left nor a right. But for the sake of Moses, he says, I'm going to show you what in your mind would just be my back. But I've got to cover you with my hand in the cliff of the rock. Glory to God. And every time somebody asks, may I see your glory? But things changed. Philip looked at Jesus one day. John 14, Philip said, show us the Father so that it satisfy me. Here Philip came to a point. He says there's got to be more. Right. He's got to the same place where Moses got. He said, I need to see. And here's Jesus' response. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you do not know me? This is the thing with humans. We're asking for something we already have. Mm -hmm. Because our expectations are unrealistic. Yes. I want to preach to somebody this morning who doesn't understand the name of Jesus. You see, yeah, he, uh, he has given him a name that is greater than every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. You're asking for something you already have. Right. I want to come to tell you that's why the priesthood ended. Because the moment Jesus went to the cross, mm -hmm. and when that blood came out of his side, Hallelujah. He says, now what you've been asking for, now you have. You see, there was a time when my presence was separated from you. But now, I have created a scenario. One morning, I got up to pray, and Jesus spoke in my spirit. He said, do you realize how you just walk up to me and start talking? Mm -hmm. You just walk up. Get a good morning, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> see, we don't understand the privilege that we have. Right, right. That's right. Ah, the man says, God, show me your glory. He says, no, I'm going to show you just a twig. But Philip said, show me the Father. Jesus said, you can't ask me for something you already have. Yeah. Have I been so long with you, walking around with you, and you're asking me to show you the Father? You don't get it, do you? You see, that's why some people don't want to baptize in Jesus' name. You know why? They don't understand the power that's in the name. Right, right. You don't get it, do you? He has given it a name that is greater uh, than every other name. That at the name of Jesus, Hallelujah. every knee yes. shall bow. Yes, yes, yes. Glory to God, John said in John chapter 1, verse four, 14. John said, put it this way, he said that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld, beheld means to look at. So now, just like Moses, who wanted to see God's glory, just like Philip, who wanted to see the Father, the Bible said the Word, the living Word of God, took on flesh, came and dwelt and walked among us. And we, the people, saw his glory. Is glory as of the only begotten. That's why we call him the son of the living God. Right, right. Hallelujah. Full of grace and truth. Glory to God. We just talked about Philippians 2 9. God exalted him and given him a name above every other name but what I love. Uh, David said so many prophecies. Uh, Psalm 138 verse 2. He says, I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and for your truth. For you have magnified, listen to this, your word. 
above what? Remain. Right. So let me break it down for you. The word of God became flesh. Right. Dwelt among us. And he gave him a name greater than every other name. It's even greater than the name Jehovah. Right. You know why? Because he exalted his word right. above his name. <laughs> so I come to tell you, the only difference between a bath you took this morning and the baptism you did is the name that was called right. over you. Right, 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 right. right. Hallelujah, Jesus. I want somebody to really understand this. This is why anywhere you go, somebody say they're going to baptize you. You've got to ask what name will you call over me? I was talking to Sister Raggedy, we were just rambling on, and we just talked. And I, we were talking about the detergent. And I used this, this analogy, which was kind of gross, to describe it. That if I went to have a shower and I use water only, I might come out feeling a little fresh, like I took a swim. But if I really did some hard work before, which is pretty much like sin, I might still smell. And somebody got to understand that when you're baptized without the name of Jesus, that's pretty much like me taking my bath without detergent. Right. Because it is the formula by which sin is removed. Amen. See, when Jesus went to the cross, somebody, Hallelujah, you see that name now becomes greater than every other name. And that name becomes the only detergent that can literally erase sin. Right, right. When uh, Paul, you will know Paul, listen to what they told Paul to do. I don't know if I have the scripture here with me, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, paraphrase the scripture. He says to Paul, now arise and be baptized Washing away your sins. Right. Calling upon the name of the Lord. Right. Right. Amen. Arise. Baptize. Washing away your sins. Calling upon the name. See that? Right. right. So we need to tell somebody. Baptism is absolutely essential. Right. But you got to take your detergent with you. Right, right. I want to tell you in the book of Acts chapter 19, Paul himself, the same Paul, who God told him to arise and baptize, calling upon the name. In other words, when I dip you in this pool, and I say, brother or sister so-and-so, the name that I call over you is what makes that baptism effective. Right. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Acts chapter 19. Paul goes up to Ephesus and finds a group of people worshiping. Paul says to them, first question, I see that you're Christians. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Oh Lord have mercy. This is a question very people don't ask these days. We just assume that someday in the time of the night while we are asleep, the Holy Ghost sneaks in. Yeah. Yeah. Just makes a ooh, I'm coming. But that's not how it works. The question is logical. You're a believer. I know you believe in Jesus. I know you love him. Come on now. I know. I know. I know. I can see you clap your hands. I see you praying. You are a believer. But have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? It's a yes or no. Let me share something with you in your great imagination. When you travel from one place to get to Ephesus in those days, 
Paul had no airplane. Paul had no nice car or jeep to travel over those rocks and stones. So you're either going by ship to some places to shorten your distance, right? And you know those old ships with those sails, terrible journeys. I don't see Paul traveling in those treacherous circumstances from wherever he was to get to Ephesus just for a formality. Right. So if Paul goes up to a church in Ephesus and he baptized over the whole church, it must be important. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's not a formality. That's not something you can yes. overlook. Paul says, you don't know about the Holy Ghost yet. Ain't nobody told you. You ought to get this baptism of the Spirit after you believe. Oh, well. And then Paul says, that, wait a minute. Unto what? Hallelujah. Yeah. Unto what were you baptized? You need to be baptized unto Jesus. Hallelujah. Right, right. See, Paul was very peculiar that the name be called over you. Right, right. For it absolutely is your detergent that moves in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul said, come here, church. I love you. I know that you love the Lord. You first. He says, wait, 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 Paul. I, I, I'm already baptized. And this is what we're doing today, some of us. Uh, in Christendom. I'm already baptized now. Yeah. Right. Somebody took care of it. And Paul says, you're already baptized. I know you're already baptized. Mm -hmm. But I'm too bad. Right, 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 right. And Paul says, come here, brother so-and-so. <laughs> I know John baptized you so long ago, but I need you to make it. Shut up, son. I need you to make it. I love you, my brother. So I'm going to do it again. In fact, we can't accommodate the first one. But this one, Paul says, I baptize you in the name of Jesus, Lord and Savior. For that is the removal of your sin washing away. Of your sin now, Paul. And Paul never stopped in the whole church was we baptized. I pray for somebody this morning. You got some preacher. You it is your life dependency. It is important that you ask your preacher. And to what are you baptizing me? Don't just wash me in water, somebody. Don't just wash me. I ain't taking no bath. I bathed this morning. I'm water at my home. You don't need to wet me up. But if you're going to call Jesus' name over me, now you're talking to me. My sins are washed away. You see, the problem we have is that we don't believe in the name. If you only hear that, he says to them that believe, gave him power to be called the sons of the living God. Believe in what? Believe that the name is so great yeah. that literally when I go in that pool, the name of Jesus washed away my sin. That's the God that you serve. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The priesthood became a job because there was no name. Right. There was no name to use to wash away of your sin. Oh, so the priesthood was a job. It was an office. And the, the priesthood had a problem. In the book of Isaiah 29. Hallelujah. Where to go? Verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said. This is Isaiah the prophet. I love Isaiah. Uh, that man, God really gifted that prophet. He says, for as much as these people draw near me with their mouth and their lips honor me, but have removed their heart far from the Holy Ghost in this church, Jesus, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. 
That was one of the problems with the priesthood. You see, today, I come to tell somebody, I hope that thing is recording because you need to hear this somebody up there. <laughs> you don't have a priest except Jesus. Right. 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 Hear anybody? Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost up in here. Right. Who calls themselves priests? Don't understand what they're saying. <laughs> Priests do not exist. Amen. Right, right. Pretty much like Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah. Until you go to the high priest right. who is Jesus Christ. Right. The problem with the priesthood, which is the problem I see today, is that the Bible says, not my words, that the people draw near to me so their mouth is saying the right thing. He says their mouth and their lips honor me, but their heart is nowhere near me. Isaiah 1 verse 13. God said to them, bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The same thing God asked you for suddenly becomes an abomination. He, he realizes, let me tell you something. There is nothing like somebody doing something for you and they're not doing it with their heart. Right. If you find it out after a while, it, it loses its meaning. And so they're bringing all these things. And here's the thing. He says, your new moons and your Sabbaths and calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even your solid meaning. Oh, right. church, what's going on? But he says, your new moves and your appointed feasts, my soul hate. Yeah. They are trouble unto me, and I am tired. Yeah. Here's the problem with the priest word. I can do anything I want as long as I do what the priest tells me. Right. And everybody here knows I'm talking the truth. Mm -hmm. I said, priest, listen, I, I did so and so, I do my confession, and, mm -hmm. I did so much sins, and says, all right, do, I don't know how many penance, right? Do so and so, say this, do that. And I go through the ritual with my heart right. in the same place. That's right. Yeah. But what they fail to tell you is that that separation between man and God is convenient for you because you really don't want to meet God. Right, right. <laughs> you won't want to. You know, interested in him, so you're glad for the middleman. <laughs> There's something in the conscience that tells you that in fact, I, Dave is a priest. I said, Dave, I have sinned. I don't know how the words work. I have sinned or something. And Dave says, uh, all right, uh, say 50 Hail Marys. And I say, everyone here with me too. And Dave says, good to go. And I turn away with my conscience sneer. Mm -hmm. That I have done what I need to do. But my heart is far away from God. Right, right. Today, with the blood of Jesus shed, and that beautiful name that can wash away sin, when I approach him, all I've got to do is call upon that name. Right. But the problem is, my heart got to be at the right place. Oh, amen. I, I gotta watch that. Amen. <laughs> Now, the fivefold ministry, I'm going to slow down right here and go into teaching mode because I really need this to get there. Listen, there's a fivefold ministry in the church of the living God. And the Bible says, uh, if I can read it, he's, he gave some apostles and prophets, teachers, uh, five main ministries. Yes, and he gave some apostles and some prophets evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Listen again. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 and he gave some what? Apostles. Apostles. We're, we're talking about offices in the church now. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And he made some what? Prophets. Ephesians 4 verse 11. And he made some pastors mm -hmm. and some teachers. For the perfecting of the same and for the work of the ministry. Guess what's missing from that? Priest. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know? Yes, sir. 
Because the moment Jesus died, you remember the Bible says when he died, he gave up the ghost. The Bible says in the temple, in the place where they used to offer their sacrifices, the Bible says that the veil of the temple cut open. In other words, I'm telling you, there is no more separation. That separation that God kept telling them, I can't come near you because I'll destroy you. He says, the blood of Jesus took care of that. So as bad as you and I were, <coughs> so bad that the power of God would have consumed us if we would approach him. When Jesus' blood shed and washed over me, God said, I cannot see your sin no more. Right, right. That's why I just walk up to him. I just feel in the morning, hello, Jesus. <laughs> We take that for granted. You just get up out of your bed with morning, Jesus. And don't realize what it took to get you there. That's why some of us don't pray. We don't understand what it took God to get you there. Good morning, Jesus. How are you going to say? Hallelujah. Good morning, Jesus. I have something in my spirit said, so don't take that for granted. Oh my God. Veil of the table red. That's why he says this name. You know, the name doesn't mean anything to you if you don't believe in the name. Meaning that you've got to understand the power that's in it. Your sins are washed. Right, right, right. Glory to God. I come to tell somebody. If somebody baptizes you, and you're not sure what they called over you. Do like the people in Acts 19. Right. You need one of those preachers to come up to your church. Or you need to get to a place where you can look the pastor in the face. And when he's going to baptize, he says one name. Right, right. Look at him in his eye. And say, Pastor, what name are you calling call when you think? Right. Because if you don't call the unpowerful name over me, there is no washing. Right, right. I've seen it. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I, I'm going to close in a while. But I come to tell somebody there is no priest in the five fivefold ministry. It's a scam. Right, right. It's to get to keep you far from God while you feel. Your conscience smeared like you did something. You didn't do anything. Yeah. God opened the door that you can walk up to him in the morning. I don't care if you're on drugs. Walk up to him. I don't care what kind of lifestyle you're living. He has given you the opportunity to walk up to him in the morning. I say, here I am. Right. And call his name. And he doesn't destroy you. He says, come. My yoke is easy and my burden light. Right. Why don't you come? Don't get scammed out of eternal life the way Adam and Eve did. Yes. Right. Don't get scammed. Glory to God. What happens to them is that the moment the enemy says to him, don't you take God serious. There's more to what he tell you. The Bible says repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 2. Read it for yourself. For, I love the Bible. Anything it tells you to do, it tells you why. Did you know that? Always look for that yeah. for. Yeah. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Why? For yes. Yes, the yes, removal yes. of sins, yes. planes. Yes. Yes. Then he didn't stop there. He says, here's a sweet part. And this promise belongs to you. Right. And any other Christian that was born after this hour, <laughs> right. your sons and your daughters, right. oh priest, I come to tell you, right. Right. you yourself need the name to wash away your sins, right. oh priest. Right. Glory to God. But Adam and Eve, they like the pretty tree. 
And the idea that there's more to know. You could go to a million Bible schools. It's so easy. Just do what God tell you. He said, baptize in Jesus' name. It's not a formality. It's not because he just had many words to say. Because that's what you should actually do. Right, right, right. Glory to God. And so this morning, when we understand the power that is in the name, I realize when I breathe that name, uh, some people call the name just so lightly. You can use it for whatever you want. Some people use it for different, you know, you just use the name. But he says it to them that believe, get the power. Right. Doesn't stop him. He won't strike you. Many people using the name. They use it all kinds of ways. Doesn't strike them down, does he? No. Because you can choose tomorrow to believe in the name. Right. And when you say it, right. it has a different effect. Uh, the enemy will tell you, you don't have to do exactly what God said. There's an alternative way. There's a better, get better results. Just believe. Just repeat the sinner's prayer. Just the word of God is explicit. Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling <laughs> right, amen. upon the name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I am amazed that God would look at a sinner like me. I am amazed that he would come all that way and shed his blood. I, I am amazed that he would think of me. I, I right. want somewhere that says, I don't know why Jesus loved me. I don't get it. But he did. 